Okay, we're back in Zechariah, and I've got to circle back on this a little bit. That's a pun. <laughs> the theme of the book, when you're you know, learning how to interpret scripture, the first thing you got to do with a book, and I've never done this with Zechariah before, the first thing you're supposed to do with a book is to, is to determine the theme of the book so that you can read um, the text in light of the theme. What is the author trying to say? Because, you know, you can open up any book of the Bible and it's going to read very similarly. And the reason why it does is that the Bible is really a serial novel of, you know, God's position, history, depositions, that sort of thing. And because of that, each book on its own has to be a complete unit Therefore, it has to cover all the same themes as the prior books, plus it needs to advance the themes of the prior books and interlink with them in, in such a tightly woven way you know it comes from God. Else, how do you know it's not the hallucination of the writer? So, your first task is to determine what the writer is intending to say, not the doctrines that we think we know or do know, but what is the writer saying? Because it's going to be covering familiar ground, but in new ways, and you need to know, you know, what's his angle. Just like when you're watching a movie, you know, most of the popular movies on TV are like sex and violence and money and fame, you know. But they cover them in different ways. Well, it's the same thing with the Bible. So when I said I'm going to circle around back on Zechariah, that's his theme right here. Return to me that I may return to you. This is the most famous idea in Judaism. The idea of return. I said that in the, the last segment. But think about this. See, you always have to think like a thesaurus with Bible, especially its metaphors. Return, return. Okay? So, that denotes a circle and a circle. Got that? And he's telling you, and this is what the, there's one of the tasks that the writer's supposed to do in a book uh, of the Bible, is you set the theme of the book in your first chapter. Okay, we saw that with Luke, where he reverses, his theme is reversal because he's reversing the order of Matthew, and he's focusing on what Matthew leaves out to show the reversal to church. Um, telling the same story, he's doing the setup, he's showing you how, it, why it changed. Whereas Matthew's job was simply to record from the official, you know, kingship position. Okay, so here we got a similar thing going on with Zechariah wrapping his book around other famous books in specific passages, actually. Remember I said this was the eighth month, this was between the Booth's uh, visit, you know, here in Haggai. See, Haggai 2. Just after this is when Zechariah also comes, second witness, in the eighth month. And because this text is so familiar, the theme of it is so familiar, we just gloss over it. But when he says this, he's quoting specifically, oh, kills me. He's specifically speaking to back to Psalm 90 because that's its theme. Moses uses the word return and concepts of return of time to show the time is a circle, which means it's a cycle, because he's talking about the 490s and the 70-year voting periods. <coughs> and so what we're, we're seeing here is that Zechariah is invoking that very theme of time, which means that there are parts of Zechariah that are metered. I'm going to groan now, because it takes a very long time to work out the meter. Um, so I'm going to have to spend a lot of time in Zechariah later. But right now I just want to show you, because Mary's quoting Zechariah too, also. Ugh. This is incredible. The sophistication just blows me away. Sorry. Okay. When he says, return to me that I may return to you, that is the sort of cadence and theme of Psalm 90, the cycle of time. Everything returns to God. Just go read the words, even if you don't know the meter, and you'll see that. He's talking about the returning to God. God sends out a thing, it comes back to them. Time is a cycle. You see that in the meter, the way he does the meter. Because it's an 84 and then uh, 70, 70, 70, 
and then uh, 56 because all of time was supposed to run 5250 years okay so you know <laughs> Zechariah is talking back to that and he's also talking back to Daniel 9 specifically because this is a, a theme Daniel was playing on Psalm 90 in this in this very way this business of about returning we did not return to you you talked to us we did not return to you so Zechariah is opening his book and which means God is opening his talk to Zerubbabel and you know the Jews in the land before they get the answer from Darius he's reminding them of what time it is this is specific because Psalm 90 is metered with a meter of time going back to Adam. Daniel 9 is metered with a meter of time showing the indictment of Israel's kings and the prayer that he had to restore time by restoring the temple. That's what Daniel's meter is, and God replied to him in the same meter in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. And if you go and watch those videos where I did it on Psalm 90 and Daniel 9, you'll see that. Because I go through the math, I go through the meter, I go through the Hebrew, everything. It's exhaustive, though. It, it, you know. So when he says, return to me that I may return to you, you know, to us in English, it's like, well, yeah, it sounds nice. We don't get all this other meaning. But you would get it if you knew the themes of those two chapters and he's linking them linking them again this is more proof that ah duh Daniel was written in 538 okay then do not be like your father see this is relevant because in the meter you don't know that just from the words you have to know that it's metered in the meter of both Psalm 90 and Daniel 9 it's a retrospective exposition of what the fathers did. It is a retrospective indictment of how the fathers did not listen to God. And Daniel, of course, repeats this several times explicitly. Okay? You have to know the meter. Oh, God, I need to kill myself. I shouldn't be allowed to know this and live. You have to know the meter to understand the, the impact of what he's saying to Zechariah. Otherwise, this looks like just a banal, simple, over a repetition of a, of a theme that the Bible says on damn near every page. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to, um, I'm going to have to take a break. I'm too affected by this right now. Okay, this segment's going to be on uh, Deuteronomy 32.8. I'd shown it before, but I want to cover something I've been... I haven't seen enough attention paid to. Maybe it is there somewhere. If you know of any sources that cover this differential, I would like to hear about it if you're willing to tell me. Um, this is Deuteronomy 32.8, and understandably, when you we've you know we showed it, Here's the typical translation, and they almost all agree. Uh, but the Greek and the Hebrew texts are quite different in, in nuance, not necessarily in meaning. And we got to go through that. Remember what I said before, when this whole business about number, the typical and understandable theological um, position on how the, what this verse is saying. Um, and the Jews understand it that way in a w often too, but they have a different dimension of, of understanding of it too. Is that everything revolves around Israel, and that's true. There's just no getting around that. All right, the whole Bible is designed around Israel. It's all about Israel, but Israel is about Christ, and that's what Israel, why Israel is in trouble today. The whole reason why the temple went down is Israel refused her savior when he came that was the warning in Moses that was the reason for the Mosaic law it was a post salvation code that they all had to learn in order to become a priest nation as the bride of Christ that was their job for eternity and they turned it down when he came they turned it down when you know 
they were let out of the land. In the first year that they were let out of the land, they turned it down again. In 1050 BC, when they wanted a human king, they don't want God as their king anymore. And then when God took on humanity and came to them, just as promised, just on time, and this is a verse about time, as we're going to see, they turned him down. That's the only reason church exists. And Paul goes into a lot of detail about that in Romans 9 through 11. And he expects his readers, of course, to understand the rules of time. Okay, which we don't know. But they did then. Now, that being the story, you have to ask yourself, okay, how does that actually work? And the only way you know that it works is if you understand the doctrine of time. But you're not going to see any of that if a verse like this, which a lot of people recognize, and a lot of people are against, of course, too. If you can continue to think of this solely in terms of physical number of people, and it looks like that in the text, number of the sons of Israel. Okay, but nobody knows how many those are. And so your typical, you know, teacher will explain, and, and rightly so, well, but God knows. Yeah, okay. But that's not what it's talking about. Okay, I mean, it is in the, it, the, it's in the meaning, but it, there's a lot of double entendre here, and that double entendre is communicated by the way it's translated. So we got to go through that a little bit. It's, we're only focusing on this phrase, because the rest of it, the rest of it works. You know, the translation's okay. But this is the intriguing part, and you can tell that when you see the difference between the Jews who translated it in Greek and the original Jewish text, you know, Hebrew text. Okay, this is the phrase in question in the Hebrew. According to the num number of the sons of Israel, and that is what it says. But this, kata, you know, literally means down, but according is what, you know, set down under. You know, the idea that this is the thing that's on top that you, that is laid down, the law laid down kind of thing. Principle laid down, that sort of stuff. That's the phrase in the Greek. This word here does not say Israel. In Greek, when you say Israel, it's, it's a transliterated proper name. Okay. But that is angels. Literally messengers. But the most common use of angelon in the Old Testament, angelos rather, you pronounce these two G's. I'm sorry, I should. You pronounce, see, the, these are two G's. They look like little Y's, but you pronounce them like N-G. So you say angelos, not agalos, all right? That's the most common term for angel because they're messengers of God, all right? So literally, there's a, dual, there's a dual entendre here, messengers of God. I mean, if you were to exclude the fact that in the Bible, the most usual term, the most usual use of this term is for angels when it's just used alone without any qualifiers, you know, in other words, if this was Angelos Basileus, all right, then that would be a messenger of the king, and you know it wasn't necessarily an angel. Depends on who the king is. All right, but if it's just Angelos by itself, usually that means angel in the Bible. And especially when it says Angelos Deo, Angelon Deo, all right. Sorry, I've got stuff in my mouth. Um, this is dual entendre, multiple entendre, and it's used that way in Revelation too. And John's king off it, actually. So here's, here's the point. This literally says sons of Israel. Now you, you have to, again, you can't just, you can't just read Bible like a typical book where you, you know, just read sentence after sentence after sentence. You have to pour over it. You have to pick it apart. Who is a son? Of Israel. Who's the son of Abraham? What did Christ say in John 8? If you're sons of Abraham, then you should do what Abraham did. What did Abraham do? Genesis 15, 6. The reason why he's called Avraham, father of many nations, is that the nations that believe like he believed are deemed sons of Abraham too. Now, Jacob is one of those sons grandson actually and when Jacob believed 
God changed his name to Yisrael, Prince of God. So who are the sons of Israel? Believers. I mean, there's a big debate in, in, in Judaism, and especially in Israel, about what constitutes a Jew. And there have been all kinds of people who are trying to say that they're the true Jews, blah, 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 blah. All right? With nobody looking at the Bible by its own definition. The Bible says that you're a Jew by race if Abraham is your ancestor. And that was the big argument that the Pharisees made to Christ in John 8, for example. We are the sons of Abraham. We are the lineal descendants of the loins of Abraham. And they were. By blood. That's a race. Okay? Abraham became a new race when he was circumcised. You know that story. All right? He didn't become a new race because of his own blood. He became a new race by a miracle of God when he circumcised because he believed. And that's the big point that Paul talks about in Romans 9. But that was always, always how you became a Jew. See, there's two meanings to Jew. You got the bloodline of Abraham. Anybody who's got one gene even of Abraham in his body is a Jew, whether he th knows it or not. That's, that's race. Okay? But you're a Jew by faith. Genesis 15, 6, if you believe as Abraham did. That was Christ's big point. And Paul's big point in Romans 9, in particular, is that you're a son of Abraham if you did what Abraham did, keying off John 8. You know, because John wasn't written yet, but the contents were known. Okay? Because you were always made a Jew if you believe. When the Exodus occurred, it had so-called mixed multitudes. That's the King James, you know, translation. It means that there were a whole lot of Egyptians and other peoples who came out with the Jews. That's why there were six million of them, estimate, two million adults. They figured two kids each. That's why there were so many. They weren't the, they weren't the racial sons of Jacob. Jacob only entered the land with 70. 70, even in 400 years, is not going to equal six million people. Okay, the, the mothers would have been dead from childbearing. So they were conversions. It included conversions because you did what Abraham did, and that made you a son of Israel. Because that's what Israel did, namely Jacob. So when it says here the sons of Israel, you got, first of all, the meaning of the bloodline. Okay, and that would be valid. All history revolves around Israel. Okay, but who is Israel? Israel is, is a bloodline, so that's one layer of meaning. Another layer of meaning that's wider is anybody who did what Israel did. Israel did what Abraham did. He believed. That's why he was renamed Israel from Jacob. He went from Chisler to Prince of God. The Bible's very economic in its wording. So when it gives you a title or a name, you've got to find out what that name means. Because it tells you about the person, it tells you a whole lot of text that, you know, you can understand with just one word memorized. Okay? So, God did it according to the sons of Israel. The sons of Israel mean believers. Now, the translators, okay, of the text, and this is played on in the New Testament, changed it to angelon, angelon te'u. Okay, but a believer is a messenger of God. Okay, but this also means angel. And that references the angelic conflict. You see how deaf this is? One word. You have to pay very close attention to the wording. You always have to do that with legal contracts. Depositions, the whole bit. The whole Bible is a kind of legal contract. It's a legal contract with depositions. Alright? And they recognized the wider meaning of this when they translated it. And of course they're translating it in Greek. And they're referencing the post-salvation role of the believer. They're also referencing the angelic conflict. And they knew the meter of the rules of time. Because the whole thing about time is designed around the terms of the angelic conflict. 
Now, that means that this whole doctrine about time and, you know, here it's talking in a way of physical terms, but you can't have boundaries and peoples and inheritance. You can't have the physical without the time. There is a time. In other words, there's a time when, see, if it says the boundaries of the peoples, that means that for a certain amount of time they will be living in a boundary, but they're going to die. There's a certain amount of time that they live in a boundary, but somebody's going to take them over. See, an inheritance requires time. Inheritance gets used up, an inheritance gets transferred to death. So you can't read this without knowing that he's talking about time. So when it says number of the sons of Israel, first of all, it's talking about the bloodline, yes. It's also talking about those who did what Abraham did. And that can mean people who aren't of the bloodline, which of course it always did. In the Old Testament, if you believed in Christ, you were, you were called a Jew. Nowadays, you're called a Christian, but that's just the name. It's the same function. And time now depends on you. My pastor stressed this unbelievably a lot. It's one of the reasons why I know this thing about the meter. Because I, I asked God for proof of what, what he was talking about. When he taught Genesis 5, he said that, that believers are here to buy time. And of course, that's what Ephesians 5.16 and Colossians 4.5 say. Best translated in the KJV. KJV wins that translation battle. Okay, the other translations are horrible. Time is designed around Christ. That's Hebrews 1. Not the only place it's located, but that's, that's a quintessential verse on it. It's mistranslated in the KJV as worlds. I think it's uh, Hebrews 1 3. Okay, when he, designed, when he designed time, he designed it around Christ. Well, Christ is the number one son of Israel. What did Christ have to do to get to the cross? He had to keep believing. If he stopped believing for one nanosecond, he would have sinned. You see this? And the reason why I'm focusing on this verse and this topic is that Mary understood this doctrine. It blows me away. Okay? And I want to show how deft you can make the reference when you just say number of sons of Israel and you ignore the wider context of the translation, you're missing the point. You have to go back to the original language and you have to examine well, what is Israel? What are the sons of Israel? Not all those stupid Christian identity people. Not the Arabs who are trying to take away Israel's inheritance and will never succeed. If you want to be a son of Israel, do what Abraham did. Believe. And then, you know, it's a question of what's the right post-salvation spiritual contract under which you train. In the Old Testament, it was the Mosaic Law. Now that's been changed. That's what the book of Hebrews explains. But you see, it's just one word, Israel. So when a person says Israel in the Bible, you have to look at the context of how they're saying it. Do they mean Israel in the broader sense of this believer? Because that's what this is talking about. Or does it mean Israel the land mass? Or does it mean Israel, you know, Jacob? And so when somebody's quoting or using a prophecy with a keyword like Israel in it, like here, because it's prophetic, this is saying all time is designed around Israel. Okay, well, who's Israel? Well, in this case, it is the land mass, it is the bloodline, and it is the time, and it is the number of people who do what Abraham did. All of those meanings. And that we know because they use the word angelon here. A messenger needs time to give his message. You know that. We're here for a certain amount of time. That's Psalm 90. Psalm 90 is, of course, part of what Moses is going to say because this is the song of Moses. It's one of the verses in it, see. Here's the context, the larger part of it. See? This is what Moses says just before he dies. There's his little, you know, soliloquy, his ending soliloquy. 
and it's poetic and it's probably metered. I'll die before I get to find all the metered passages in the Bible. Zechariah is metered and I can't talk about it now. I'm too shocked. I'm Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, it's hard to talk right now. This has got all of the meanings of Israel, all of the meaning of sons of Israel, and all of the meanings of number in it. Be, and how do we know that? I should have covered that. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm really discombobulated right now. Probably shouldn't even be making a video. Number. Uh, yeah, because it showed the dual, triple, quadruple entendre. They're referencing that there is more than one meaning when they retranslate it this way. They could have written the word Israel right here. They knew to do that, but they they knew that wasn't the whole meaning. They knew it was broader, so they just changed it to Angelon. Some sometimes the trend. That's why you know some parts of the of the LXX no wonder it's quoted so much in the New Testament. Some parts of it are just deftly brilliant. You can't say that the whole book is, is um, inspired because it's got lots of junk in it too. But there are sections that just, they really got it right. Okay. Angelon, we've covered the duality of that. That, well, of course, we know there's no de debate there. Arithmon is the translation of Zephyr. Technically, you have to call that Zafar. Okay, here's the word. And yeah, it means census and enumeration. Okay, but safar is used in many ways in Hebrew. And, and what it's really talking about in the broader sense of the term, as you can see from the semantic range illustrated here, writing, book, scribe, they, they, talk, they call it safar Torah. All right? And... Uh, I don't want to get too far afield. The idea of Zafar Torah is that you're going through the Torah and learning it all. And long ago, I'm not sure quite when, the Jews came up with a sort of, this is where we get our idea of reading the Bible in one year. They have, they especially in synagogues today, they have schedules of what passage of scripture um, you read and talk about and think about for a given shul service, okay? And they have special passages they use for bar mitzvahs and blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's the idea, is you're, you're going through, that the whole idea of enumeration means that you're going through in an orderly fashion to, deter, to, to learn all of it in sections. Okay? And that's the same idea with a census. In a census, you're taking, you're, you're, you're learning the whole body of the people. How many, what's the composition, what, you know, that kind of thing. And that's what they mean by Sefer Torah. In other words, when it says number, it means the entire scope and, and meaning and depth and the wholeness. The whole body of. Okay, the whole text of. And then it's got a connotation of enumeration because you're learning, you're memorizing it, and you're, going, you're learning to recite it by heart. And that's why they divided it into sections. Okay? And, you know, you can talk to any rabbi about that. Because they have a whole schedule that they usually publish a year in advance about what, what this, the Torah section is that they're going to cover. And they do it like that every year. I, it's not, to me, a good way of study, but, hey, that's their, their method. All right, so Sefer Torah is really the idea behind this. All right, learning the whole body of scripture. So when you when when you got this word being used, okay, you're not just talking about a number of people. You're talking about the concept of number in all of its facets, the whole body of. All right? And the whole body of a people depends on the body of time allotted to the people and that's what Psalm 90 is about. Okay? Even the text, if you didn't know it was metered and you just read it, you see it's all about returning to God and the body 
of time that is allotted to man and the general refrain in the Psalm 90 is that it usually ends badly because men usually end up being negative to God at the end and they're ticked off at him okay and that's Psalm 90 which he's writing at the same time he's writing Deuteronomy 32 8 so it's very topical okay I, I couldn't tell you if he wrote Psalm 90 first or if he wrote Deuteronomy 32 8 first I'm, I'm not sure I'd have to really examine it and I don't know if I really know but they're con they're coterminous at this they're at the same time they're two sides of a coin and this is center to both of them okay the song of Moses and and uh, Psalm, Psalm 90 Deuteronomy 32 8 and Psalm 90 so when it says the number of the sons of Israel it's you're supposed to interpret that as broadly in as many um, facets as possible because you are son of Israel if you believed in Christ you were son of Israel if you were um, from the loins of Abraham which is the big point that the Pharisees made as if mindless corpuscles made them more important than everybody else well they are more important than everybody else that's a, that the world is really upset about that they are more important but that doesn't mean they're gonna inherit and that's what uh, Romans 9 is about just because you're a son of Abraham if you don't do what Abraham did and Paul's writing in Romans 9 to remind everybody of the content of John 8 then you don't inherit it's just like the difference between Jacob and Esau Esau didn't believe and Jacob did they were both sons of Abraham but Esau didn't believe so Esau doesn't inherit he lost out on the inheritance not simply because Jacob chiseled him out of his you know inheritance for a bowl of, of lentil stew alright and number isn't just a number of people it's the number of time and we know that for sure because it's Moses writing this and he's writing Psalm 90 at the same time so this focuses on the context of here see look the Lord is your father see this is repeated in Isaiah 63 is not the Lord your father that's all over the Mishnah too okay he bought you and established you he's he this is a prophetic psalm chiding them in advance for their you know refusing him you know return to God this is, he's always on that theme especially in Deuteronomy okay see consider the years of generations that's Psalm 90's theme also ask your father he will inform you Zechariah is also tying back to this that's why I interrupted the Zechariah uh, coverage and went back here see consider the years see he's talking time and Psalm 90 reinforces this ask your father and your elders don't do what your fathers did that's what Zechariah was saying Zechariah 1 when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance he based it on the sons of Israel in other words believers run the world when something goes wrong it's our fault Leviticus 26 time is designed around believers and the in the Old Testament if you were a believer you became a son of Israel by faith or you were also one by bloodline but if you were one by bloodline and not by faith you still got the protection because you were a son of Abraham but you're not going to inherit the eternal promise that's the theme of Romans 9 for the Lord's portion is his people the Lord's portion the Lord lasts forever your body doesn't again time is being stressed Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance Jacob became Israel because Jacob did what Abraham did he believed Esau did not do that okay so I'm gonna stop here but I, I just needed to to clarify what that meant and how we know because Both Aritmon in Greek and Safer. Aritmon is easier to remember, that's where we get arithmetic, so I don't have to cover that. Safer in particular is a cultural reference.
with this kind of semantic range. It's talking about the Bible. It's talking about learning scripture. It takes time to learn scripture. Okay? That's the semantic range of Zafar. And that is in view. Be and we know that because they're changing this to Angolon, not just Israel, which they could have written there. That would have been the literal translation of this phrase. They knew it had the wider meaning. So they translated it with the wider meaning. So you know Aritmon, which just means number. It could be a number of anything. It's got the wider meaning. Messengers need time to give the message to everybody because everybody, if you were in the Old Testament and you believed in Christ, you were a Jew by faith. You did what Abraham did. In the New Testament, you believe in the same person, only you're called a Christian. Or you might still think of yourself as Jew, but you are a Christian. And you can call yourself whatever you want. You'd be a Buddhist. And if you believe in Christ, you're a Christian, no matter what you call yourself. You call yourself a Muslim. If you believe in Christ, you're still a Christian. Even though you call yourself a Muslim, it doesn't matter. And you become a son of Israel because Israel believed and so did you. Okay? So time depends on you. Time depends on how you live. Time depends on how long you live. What's going to happen to your neighbor, your best friend is Leviticus 26. Depending on what you do with whether or not you, Zephyr, learn the book. Can you enumerate the book? Enumerate means, you know, you, you know the syllables. Do you know the syllables? Can you enumerate the syllables? Have you memorized it? Did you learn Bible? The inheritance depends on whether you learn Bible. That's what he's talking about there. Time depends. The quality of it and the quantity of it depends on whether you learn Bible. And that's why, and they knew this, because they're using Angolon here. Okay, this is another, I'm going back to Zechariah. I'm, I'm really in a state of shock. Uh, the reason I'm I'm doing these little snippet videos, uh, you know, snippet sections, is because when Mary does her soliloquy, which is you know the most we ever hear her talk, she's referencing all this, and I'm trying to pick out the pattern. You know, she's leading, she's taking one keyword after the next keyword after the next keyword. She 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 knows scripture as well as Paul. That's what's shocking me so much. Um, she's pulling together all these different places of scripture to say her soliloquy and she's just talking okay she's talking to Elizabeth it's not like she's crafting a novel where you sit down and you write down your keywords and you plan them and all that stuff she's just talking off the top of her head and I don't know maybe I anyway I'll get back to that in a minute. The point here of this video, sorry, is to still document or verify that Zechariah is fingerprinting both Psalm 90 and uh, Daniel 9 together. And he is. The highlighted blue is actually a quote from um, Psalm 90 in the mosaic section between 12 verses 12 through 15 um, where Moses pleads with God to return to to Israel in other words return to us deliver us and Admetai is a very poignant point a poignant part in that section of the Psalms which is of course Moses own vote and testimony in time and then he also uses Rechem which is these are frequent keywords in the Bible but they're key, they're frequent as quotes. That's what we all don't understand. It's like saying, never mind, like Gilda Radner used to. And the words never mind, anybody can say them and they mean just what they sound like. But when she said it, she was doing this character of this sort of like spinster woman. And it was very funny. So you, if you heard the voice, if I replicated her voice properly and you had heard that many times you would be thinking specifically of that not just of the words and that's what these guys are doing when he says Admetai he's invoking that section of Psalm 90 especially since he's pairing it up with Rechem 
which, which literally means womb, but it, it ends up having a figurative meaning of compassion. <clears throat> you know, tender mercies, the idea of a mother's love, and Mary's playing on that, of course. Okay, so we, we've seen that compassion is rechem, which is based on the word for womb. We also saw that myrtle is a term for Israel. But what I forgot to tell you is that um, in Hebrew that means Hadassah, and that translates as Esther. Okay, so Zechariah is specifically using this terminology for Israel because he's he's you know prophetically forecasting the role of Esther. Okay. That's what will make the book of Esther so meaningful. So the, those who are who, the dumb ones, okay, who try to argue that Esther doesn't belong in the Bible, they're, they're not paying sufficient attention to prophecy and the, the fine-tuning of words. That's why this is being used here, okay? He's forecasting because, see, all the earth is quiet, but within a generation, Israel's existence is going to be threatened by Haman and all the other people who are anti-Semitic, just as there was a threat during Daniel's day. It just keeps on popping up like a bad penny, you know, because Satan's behind anti-Semitism. Okay, and that's why a lot of this is here is to forecast what's going to happen under Esther, and that there will be an Esther. And of course, Mary is the quintessential Esther in view. Okay, so that's why he's, 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 they're like little hints. And again, it's like, never mind. If you know what's behind that tone of voice, then this isn't just words to you. It's got a specific meaning. So somebody reading the book of Esther and then reading Zechariah will, re will notice that, just like I did. Okay, compassion, rechem, they'll notice that. Okay. You know, and um, Paul will, you know, liken himself to a woman about to give birth in Galatians 4.19 and equate the world as, as if it were about to give birth in Romans 8. You can't see any of that in English because they sugar it over or they cover it over because it's not politically acceptable to talk about pregnancy that way. Okay, the 70 years here is dating back to Ezekiel. It's specifically talking about when Ezekiel's ministry started. And Ezekiel talks about Daniel. So again, it's a reference to Daniel's timeline. And to Jeremiah 25 and 29, because there were multiple deportations. And Ezekiel in particular is in his fifth year after the deportation of Jeconiah, when Ezekiel begins. And there's more to the story, but I'm, I'm just trying to show highlights now because in the next video, I'm going to introduce Mary. You know, because there, there's been such a divergence, such a digression that I think I need you to see what Mary's actually doing. And then all this, you know, all these hours of videos in between Luke 20, 126 and 136, where we stopped in Luke, um, is going to make sense. But I'm trying to show you the keywords. You know, I'm, I'm going to have to go over it again, but right now we're going to do it quickly. So there's Myrtle. Okay, that means Hadassah. That means Esther. That's Rechem, meaning womb. Comes to mean compassion figuratively. The 70 years is going to be an important reference. We've already seen that that has to do with the meter. That also has to do with Daniel 9. And, and it's going to be a specific reference that Mary's going to make because Mary's um, Magnificat is meter. So you want to look out for that. And then you've got gracious words, comforting words. She's going to be playing on that. And then the angel speaking to me said, Proclaim, I'm exceedingly jealous. I'm going to punish, you know, the nations who tried to hurt her. Mary's going to indirectly reference that. And then, of course, the Lord is playing on return, which is the main theme of Psalm 90, Daniel 9, Isaiah 53, return. And he lumps, he combines return and compassion. Okay, Mary's going to reference that too. And my house will be built in it as a double entendre. It's not only talking about the temple. It's talking about the person the temple depicts. 
Okay? And that's going to be very funny, especially in Luke 2, which we haven't gotten to yet. The part in Luke 2 where Luke fills in the blanks that Matthew doesn't say because Matthew's talking about the Magi. Luke is going to cover what Mary and Joseph were doing during that exact those exact same days, showing that they were right under Herod's nose, and yet Herod didn't know about them because he didn't know what time it was because the chief priests and the scribes didn't know what time it was. Okay, and the measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem. This again is forecasting the rebuilding of Jerusalem because this is being said um, about 521 BC when the temple hasn't been finished building and therefore Jerusalem really hasn't come into its own as a city. It won't until the temple's finished. Okay. So, this is what we want to start to look at here. And then, my cities will again overflow with prosperity. This is a dual entendre prophecy. The focus of Zechariah is the millennium. Okay, but every prophecy has two fulfillments. A near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. That's pretty standard theology. You should be able to find near fulfillment and far fulfillment on the internet. They might use different vocabulary for it now. But back in the 1930s and the 1950s, that was how they phrased the dual entendre prophecy. So the, new, the near fulfillment is going to be, you know, 516, you know, B.C. and afterwards. In fact, the prosperity becomes so great that Haman and his fellows get jealous of Jerusalem and want to wipe out all the Jews. That's the story of Esther. Okay. The far fulfillment is the millennium, which is the main topic of Zechariah. Okay. And then four horns we covered briefly, but not in enough detail, that this has to do with Greece and Rome. And there's more to say about it, but um, I'm going to leave it out. The only thing that's really important to notice about it is that it's got the horn of salvation idea, which Zacharias mentions in his own soliloquy, which is also probably metered, and I'll have to break it down and show it to you in the future. Okay, so... I'm going through Zechariah in order because I want to focus on a couple of things that are going to be necessary before we get to Mary. Okay, so now we're in Zechariah 2. And at this point, he's starting to list his visions. In other words, he started back up here. This is the last time he mentions what day of the month it is for a while. Okay? So you either presume that all these visions are related on the same day and he's just relating them to us, you know, like in order, or you presume that it no longer matters what time he got them and what time he said them. Obviously, it's near in time. So here's Zechariah 2, and it's got to build on Zechariah 1. Okay, so what builds on it? Okay, well, he's predicting that he's going to rebuild Jerusalem and destroy the enemies. Okay, well... In immediate terms, that's going to reference the forecast of what the myrtle, Esther, because Israel and Jerusalem in particular, the rebuilding is going to be um, at risk, okay, because of Haman. So he's forecasting the book of Esther there. Far fulfillment, obviously, it means Greece, it means the millennium, you know, the four the four nations that are going to come against um, Israel in the millennium. It's got a lot of layers on it. That's why this is this language seems so ambiguous. It's not ambiguous. It's multi-directional. You have to figure out all the, the the layers. Think of it like stories of a building. You know, when you have a building that's multiple stories, all the floors fit together. It's one building. But it's on multiple levels. That's how you read scripture too. Okay? So you gotta find out what all the levels are before you're really sure you know the interpretation of the passage. Because it's going in every direction. That's how you know it's written by God. Is that it can go in every direction and it's flawless once you find the right pieces. Okay? So Zechariah 2 is gonna build on this. Okay, measuring line, that's for the foundation of Jerusalem. It's again, dual entendre. Jerusalem has to be measured out in order to plan the city. Okay, at the same time, at the end of the 
tribulation. I'm sorry, I've got the hiccups. At the end of the tribulation, there's a big bloodbath. That's the theme of Isaiah 63, which everybody's had for a long time. And so the whole, the whole of Israel has to be remapped. And that's what this is talking about. Okay? It's not really to see how long, but to measure it, you know, to gauge it. All right? And it's an angel that does it. And this is really important because stupid people look at Revelation 11 and they think it's talking about Zechariah 2.1 as if Israel being rebuilt during Revelation 11's time is a good thing. It's not a good thing. It's a bad thing. That's why the two witnesses are there in sackcloth, temple mourning clothing, warning everybody away from the fake temple of Revelation 11. Okay? An angel is doing the measuring here. That means it's good. That means it's from God. But nobody's measuring the area. In Revelation 11, God sarcastically asked John to measure it, and John doesn't have the measuring line. He has a pen. So he measures out the words and writes them down. He never measures Jerusalem. He never measures the temple area. You see, a little careful reading of the Bible goes a long way. Okay, so the angel is speaking to him, was going out, and another angel, see these are angels, not the two witnesses. The two witnesses are not angels. Okay, this is what the two witnesses are not, and they don't have a measuring line, and there's two of them. And it's not a measuring line that they have, and, and it's not them who were commanded to measure. It was John. And John has a reed in his hand, not a rod. Okay? It's a play on words. Okay? And the angel is saying to the other angel, run and say that Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls. Okay, well, that can't be true before the millennium. It won't be that populated until the millennium. Okay? For I will be the wall of fire and the glory in our midst. That's not true now. There's not even a temple there now. You keep, the Shekinah glory can't indwell a temple that doesn't exist. It's against 1 Kings 9 contract. Okay? So this is like a future millennium. So he's setting up the second theme. That he's talking about the millennium. Okay? And this is the regathering. Okay, come back. That's Ezekiel 39. Ezekiel's coming out at the same time. All right, he's God Ezekiel. He's referring back to it. All right, and then he's talking more about, and, and Mary's going to be referencing this section too. After glory, he sent me after the nations that plunder you. In other words, I'm going to get even. Now you get punished. Near term and far term. Near term obviously is like you know the Book of Esther, the Purim, reversing on the people who wanted to kill the Jews. And uh, far term is going to be the millennium. And of course, you know, there's more of it than that. Many nations will join themselves to the Lord in that day and will become my people. That's not true now. That's millennial. Okay? It is true that as a result of the Purim, and you'll see that at the end of the book of Esther, as a result of Purim, a lot of people believed in Christ. So you got near term, far term fulfillment, dual entendre to prophecy, only with respect to Israel. Because Israel is the only, the only pro prophesied nation. Okay, we were not prophesied. Christ created us in Matthew 16, 18, which I'll get to in some future video, God knows when. Okay, that's millennial. That's millennial. Okay, that's millennial. Mary's going to be referencing this indirectly. Okay, but here's where the tie to Mary really gets finely tuned. Okay? And we've talked about it briefly, but we've got to go over it again. Then he, meaning God, showed me Joshua, who is now high priest. This is the same Joshua as when he was the, still just the son of the high priest, Yehozadok, in Haggai 1. Haggai 1. He is now high priest. John the Baptist is also a son of Aaron. To be a high priest, 
You had to be a son of Aaron. This is the progenitor, therefore, a progenitor of John. That's what you need to remember here. This is his, as it were, his ordination. This is recalling back to Haggai 2 on the ninth month, the 24th day, when God first went to the priest and said, you're unclean, even though you got holy meat. What you do with your outer body is still unclean. This is a play on that. It's also a forecast of Malachi, because that's what God says to the priest in Malachi when he ends the book. It's also a forecast of how the priesthood will be in the day that Mary lives, in the day that Zacharias gets his prophecy. And Zacharias, of course, is going to reference this. But Mary does, too. This is why Mary says what she says to Elizabeth. The first thing in her mind, in her meter, is that she's thinking back to Malachi, as you're going to see. And that means the prophecy of John the Baptist and John the Baptist's progenitor is Joshua. The same Joshua as in Haggai 2, the first addressed group. You know, he first he, he and Zerubbabel were alone addressed at the beginning of Haggai 1. Just those two, because they're the leaders of the nation. You've got the civil leader and you've got the spiritual leader. That's who they are. He is now doing, Zechariah is now playing that same, those same two cards. And this is the basis for, for knowing really that Mary's talking back to Zechariah and Haggai. This, this is how you know, because this is, this is what she's doing. She's dating her meter back to Malachi. Okay, because, see, now listen, Joshua the high priest, you and who? Your friends who are sitting in front of you. Indeed, they are men who are a symbol. For behold, I'm going to bring who? My servant, the branch. Mary is the descendant of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is the seed of Christ. Christ is known as the branch, the branch of Jesse. And that branch theme is going to be elaborated on next in Zechariah 4.1. The angel was speaking, he turned and roused me because he was so overcome by the previous vision of the high priest. And he says, okay, wake up now, what do you see? And Zechariah says, a lampstand. And what? Two olive trees. Olive tree is another, um, another metaphor for Israel. Okay, but two olive trees mean leaders of. One on the right side of what? The bowl. That was, in other words, the two olive trees were providing the oil that went into the bowl of the lampstand so that the lampstand would light. Oil signifies the Holy Spirit. Oil signifies the, the, the doctrine being learned under the Spirit. Okay? So these are two leaders, and we just met the first one right here. And we're now meeting the second one, who he hasn't named yet here. He's first telling them what it is, olive trees. And then Zechariah says, well, what are these olive trees? And the angel says, don't you know what these are? And so instead of directly answering him, this is so cute, his answer is embedded then this is the word of the Lord to who? To Zerubbabel. In other words, he doesn't tell Zechariah directly the names of the two. He's going to let him figure it out. So he gives him this really big hint. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. And again, not by might nor power, but by my spirit. The spirit is always analogized to oil. The oil comes from olives, and the olive trees are the venues through which the Holy Spirit is operating. In other words, Zerubbabel is the leader of the nation. He's one olive tree, and the first olive tree is Joshua the high priest. 
Okay, so the descendant of Joshua the high priest is John the Baptist. Okay, presaging Book of Esther being completed, presaging the wars being completed, presaging Israel becoming a nation again, 141 BC and afterwards. She has relative peace. Fig tree is another analogy for Israel. Okay, and the other descendant, who's the second olive tree, is Zerubbabel, whose descendant is Mary. Okay, and this is even cuter because when it says, not by might nor power, but by my spirit, how does Mary get pregnant? The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. So it's by the the spirit that she even gets pregnant. And you're going to see how she plays on that in the Magnificat. It's just hysterical. So, the next line that she plays on is, What are you, great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain. Okay? This means that the mountain is lowered. You know, you've, you've heard this in other verses. You know, especially Isaiah 9. You know, the valleys will be exalted and the mountains made low. She's going to reference that also, specifically this section, tying it also to Isaiah 9, which is about her. That was what Matthew was quoting when Matthew was quoting Isaiah 9, 6, and then Luke playfully quotes Isaiah 9, 2, which is just after Isaiah 9, 1, which is about what? Galilee of the Gentiles. The See, these people really know their scripture. Okay? And this talks back. This is Zechariah, of course, talking. This talks back to Haggai 2 when he talks about twice. The first time, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. Okay, I'll shake all the nations. And then the second time, which Mary is going to tweak in, in her Magnificat, I will overthrow the thrones. Overthrow the thrones in particular, she's going to talk about. But she doesn't use overthrow. I'm going to have to show this so that you'll get the joke when you see it in the Greek. And you're not going to see it for at least an hour or two. I, you know, it'll be like the 23rd episode before I get to it. This is the word for overthrow, katastrepho. Okay, let me show you. Because she doesn't use this word. She uses thronos. Okay, she uses thronon, actually. But katastrepho, she uses a different kata prefix verb. Katastrepho literally means to turn over. Like when the Lord turned over the tables at the temple, it, it's got that physical connotation of turning something over, flipping something over. Okay? And of course, in the immediate fulfillment of this, in Haggai 2.22, the immediate fulfillment is when Darius takes over all the other sub-kings in, in the, you know, the Levant and the, Mediter you know, the Middle East are going to get overthrown and become vassal kings or die. Alright? So she picks the word thrones out of this and changes kata strafo, turn over, to um, a, a different kata verb that literally means to, to lower. It's used of, of striking an altar when it's no longer in use. It's used of lowering a water jar. It's used of lowering um, your status. Okay? And that's why she's playing on Oops. She's playing on Zechariah 4, which is talking to Zerubbabel, O great mountain, you'll become a plain. Because that ties to Isaiah 9. It's too clever for words. Okay? This is a metaphorical depiction of lowering. doesn't use the verb that she's going to use. But it's the same idea. And then he will bring forth, the, the bring forth has got a birthing connotation. Okay, he will bring forth the top stone. Okay, and we're going to have to talk about that more later because I'm afraid this video is going to run too long. It's already 24 minutes. Okay, so, and then the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation. 
Okay, what's the foundation of the house of God? It's birth. Okay, when you just have it in your mind, when you've conceived it, it doesn't exist yet. It has to be born to exist. So when they laid the foundation, that's when it was born. Okay, that was back in Haggai 1, or, you know, um, Ezra 3. Okay, which is which Haggai 1 is talking to. And his hands will finish it. And they do, Ezra 6.15 on 3 Adar. Then you will know that the Lord has sent me to you. Okay, so she's, Mary's going to play on this also. Okay, and then, again, the olive trees, because the, the the key to the whole thing. Who are these olive trees? This is the second time he's asking. Okay, look. All right. See back here? He said, what are these? The olive trees. Don't you know? And then he gives him the big hint. He already told him about Joshua. Here's the second guy, Zerubbabel. But again, and Zechariah might be doing this rhetorically, just to, to you know, for rhetorical stress. And he says, oh, wait a minute, that's not the one I want. That's Zechariah 5. So I, I answered the second time and said, or, or then I said to him, what are these olive trees? And I answered the second time and said, what are the olive branches? That might be rhetorical. It, it, he, he might be just doing it to, um, he, he might not be saying it because he doesn't know. He might be saying it for effect. And then, then the angel answers back, maybe playing along. You don't know who these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Okay. And then he gets to say the ending. These are the two anointed ones standing by the Lord of the whole earth. Who are the two anointed ones? Zerubbabel, anointed, you know, full of the Holy Spirit, anointed. Anointed one means Christos. All right. So, hello, it means Zerubbabel, he's seed of Christ. And it means Joshua the high priest, who's a spiritual leader of the nation. It does not mean the two witnesses in Revelation, it does not mean Moses and Elijah. Okay, it can't. They've already been identified twice. The two anointed ones who are currently now, as he speaks, standing by the Lord of the whole earth. Now you can extrapolate lampstands to be any believer, but in this context, it's not talking about future, the future two witnesses. They're not in view. Okay, they are lampstands, but they aren't these two. So people who try to use this passage to say that it's risen Moses and Elijah aren't reading Zechariah 4, but Mary is, as you're going to see.